This is the School Success Podcast, a podcast for school leaders to learn from other school leaders what's working and what's not, and to get inspiration and encouragement, as well as strategies to grow school enrollment, connect with families, retain teachers, recruit teachers, and everything in between. You guys are heroes, and I cannot thank you enough for pouring into this next generation that's coming behind us. My goal is you will take at least one thing away from every episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. Please enjoy the School Success Podcast. Hey, school success makers. Today, we're joined by my new friend, Cynthia, out of the great state of Iowa. She's involved in three different schools, and we dive into all of them today, specifically one of them that's starting from scratch in the fall of 2022 and some of the challenges that are involved in that. There's some cool content in this one, so I know you guys are going to love it. Cynthia is fantastic, so please enjoy this next episode of the School Success Podcast. All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the School Success Podcast. I'm your host, Mitchell Slater. I'm joined by a new friend out of Iowa, guys. This is Dr. Cynthia Knight. She is over three different schools slash organizations, and she is CEO and director of all of them. The first one is Jordal Academy, Iowa Net High Academy, and Choice Charter School, which opens this fall of 2022. So she's got her hands full and she's actually currently just camping, just chilling out, just relaxing. No, she's working. She's working on school stuff, trying to get away and prepare for the fall. She's very busy and she's doing a lot of amazing things, which is why I wanted her on the podcast. But I don't want to take any thunder away from her. I will pass it off to her to introduce herself. So Cynthia, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm excited to share what knowledge I have and what experiences I've had that maybe somebody else can pick up and and learn from. Love it. And you're the first guest that we've had in Iowa. So what is fun to do there? What's your favorite, like some hobbies or things that if I, if anybody goes to Iowa, they have to do this thing? Well, Field of Dreams, of course, right? Because that's what we're all famous for, because it is heaven. And, oh, our state fair is amazing. You need to come during August to our state fair. It is a showcase of Iowa all around. So I would say those two things, our farmer markets are great in our little towns, and we have beautiful courthouses. So mm. it's another great thing to go see in our 99 mm. counties. <laughs> and I'm thinking some amazing corn, right? It's got to be so the amazing corn. Oh my gosh. Yes. July 4th, around July 4th, you need to come and, and taste this wonderful, sweet corn. It's amazing. Now, being in Iowa where there's a ton of corn, I'm curious, how much is corn during corn season? It's got to be super cheap, I would assume, for people who live in Iowa, right? Well, $6 a dozen. I don't know that if that's cheap um. around. Well, it's actually more than I thought it would be. For instance, I just bought local Florida corn last night at Walmart and it was on sale for 26 cents an ear. And I was like, four for a buck? Like, yes, please. Wow. And I four of them. I was like, yes. Was it good? It's, it is good. I, so that one I haven't cooked yet. We bought some Florida corn last week and we cooked it up and it's it was delicious. They yep. just harvested it here. So I was like, yeah, man, Iowa corn, maybe it's like, you know, 10 for a buck. It's I was thinking maybe. <laughs> yeah, you got you got football teams and colleges named after these corn huskers. Like you gotta. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's Nebraska, so we're not. We oh don't shoot! Play them. <laughs> shoot! That's oh, all right. I butchered it. I butchered. Well, it. That's all right. We have the Hawkeyes and we have the Cyclones. Hawkeyes. And the Panthers. Those are our state colleges. Yeah. Well, sorry, Nebraska. Forget you. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about Iowa right now. Man, <laughs> thought I had a good say in there. Well. One day I got to visit. I got to check it out. You got these three organizations and I know or school slash organizations. Let's start with the first one. Just tell me a little bit about them. Let's start with Jordal and tell me okay. what exactly that one is. So Jordal Academy is a private school that caters to students who can't or won't go back to their traditional school and whose school districts don't partner with Iowa Net High. So that's kind of the partnership between those two companies. Iowa, I'll kind of tell you the, the series of events. So Iowa Net High Academy was created um, 12 years ago. 
And it was, the primary purpose was there were 4,000 students dropping out of Iowa schools every year. And that's a lot of kids for Iowa. And I saw a need to do something different. I worked for the Department of Education in Iowa for about seven years. And some of my programming, the things that I did were dealing with the at-risk population. And still there were 4,000. Schools do a lot of things for those kids, but there were still 4,000 kids who dropped out. My own daughter dropped out, went to an alternative program. It took her 11 hours to fill out the paperwork. And I thought there's gotta be a better way to educate these young people. So went to a lot of conventions, went to a lot of, you know, working for the state, I got to go to a lot of the conferences and learn from the best of the best, right? So I started dreaming about how do we do this? How, and started talking to the kids. What is it that makes you not want to go? Why are you not going to a school? What could we do that would be better for you? And part of it was bringing the education to them. So instead of making them come to a brick and mortar school between eight and four, Iowa Net High Academy partners with school districts in Iowa. And we have 42 school districts right now that partner. There's 320 six, I think, school districts, and they try all the things that they have to offer, and then this is their last offering. So, okay, we can't get them to come. We can't get them to do the things we have offered inside our building. So, Iowa Net High Academy, here are our students. Please help them. And so, we do the academics. They all get a mentor who meets with them every week to keep them on track and keep them moving and help them with other things like the social emotional type things, building relationships, making sure they have food, shelter, clothing, you know, those kinds of things. We help those kids who are struggling with those types of issues as well. So we kind of wrap around our services around and we can do individualized education for those kids. So that's Iowa Net High Academy. And Jordal Academy, Don Jordal was my um, mentor from the very beginning. I met him on a plane trip. This is a really kind of cool story, so I'll tell you. I was going to a convention in North Carolina for at risk. He was going to Florida for a banking magazine because he owned Iowa Banking Magazine. We sat and I'm a pretty chatty person on the plane, so we had a conversation and went our separate ways. A week later, I'm sitting in Atlanta to come home to Des Moines and here comes Don Jordal again and sits beside me. <laughs> so, yeah, serendipitous. So we started talking about how things how our conferences went and what we learned and we exchanged cards. And a week later, I get Iowa Bank Magazine and it said, if I can ever help you do something, because um, I kind of told him about my hopes and dreams of creating a school for kids, I will help you. And so I knew I needed money to get this started. So I called up the, you know, the Iowa Banking Magazine guy and then he helped me get it started. So when he passed away in 20, December, 2016, and people gave money for the Jordal Academy to get started and go. So the Jordal Academy create, was created to help those kids who still wanted a high school diploma, but those four were outside those 42 school districts. So I have about 32 kids in that program. It's fee-based on their income. So most of my, I'd say 95% of the people are paying me $35 a month for their education. Wow. because that's what they can afford right so having to do lots of fundraising and you know help to keep that going and then when i was with the department of ed i always said if the charter school laws in iowa were ever to change i would apply and i would get a charter school going well a, two years ago the legislatures did that so they changed the laws and so it took them a year to get the rules figured out. And then this January, they sent out the application. I put mine in and I was the only one who applied for the founding group. Wow. Yeah. So they looked through my application. I had to go and have a couple meetings with the Department of Ed. And then I had to stay at the state school board and assure them that this was going to be a great thing for Iowa students. It's geared towards those kids who will not, cannot um, go back 
to their traditional school a lot. I'm going to work with the kids who are older first because those uh, I in Iowa, we educate to 21. So anybody 21 or younger, we'll take the older kids first and work our way backwards. This first year, I hope to have 300 students. And that's what I'm working on the rest of this time after this week is to find those 300 students and get them enrolled. The state will pay for those students. I've hired my teachers, I've hired my administration staff, and we're just ready to go as soon as we get those 300 kids and September 7th rolls around. And that's for choice or that's for the other one? That's Choice Charter School. Yep. Choice Charter School is the free public that the State Board of Education in Iowa has permitted us to start. Okay. And already got a building and everything. No building because that's the joy of this, right? Because it's all online. So all these kids will be throughout the state of Iowa and all of their education is online. We have teachers who will be online with them and they get to choose their schedule. So this is all about the students and not about the adults in the world because these students, some have to work, some, I would say most of them do not like getting up in the morning because they stay up late. So our school is very flexible in the hours that they put in, the hours that they work, so it works for them. Our education is based around the 16 career clusters and students will come in and choose a cluster to go through. Then all their math, science, social studies, English will be around what does that career need to know in math, science, social studies, English, right? And then filling in with the other things that the state says this, the students need to know um, for the standards as well but it is very student-centered. All of our work is very student-centered. Students get to choose and have a lot of autonomy in the things they read, the topics that they study in all three of those situations. So good. And you, how did you settle with the 300? Why not 200? Why not 500? What's 300? That magic number? That was a magic number that got me the staff that I needed to start with. And I wanted to start it relatively small. It's based on the other models that I've been doing for 11, 12 years. So I have a system and I have a way to do it. It is changing up the curriculum a little bit more and gearing it more towards the careers. So we're doing a little bit of, of that as well. But 300 seemed very doable to me with the amount of staff that I would like to hire this first year. There's a five-year contract. So by the fifth year, I have 1,700 wow. planned. So yeah. That's growth quick. But there's 4,500 kids last year that dropped out. So the number's not getting smaller, it's getting bigger. And so we need another option for these young people because education is the gatekeeper to many, many, many things. Getting a good paying job that's it's five or $600 more a month if you have a high school diploma than if you don't in your wages. It's, you know, being able to support yourself in a good paying job or going on to college or a trade or in apprenticeship programs they expect a high school diploma so mm -hmm. i'm connected to all of those things and we will be offering all of those things we're going to offer college credit we're going to offer apprenticeships on the job all that kind of stuff because these students need need to know what's out there Man, that's so, well, this is a perfect segue in that first section I like to talk about, which is challenges. So you have these three different programs, you're trying to juggle all of them and you're starting this new one. If you were to mention a couple, what are some of those challenges you're currently facing and how are you trying to currently combat those? So big challenge is finding teachers who are ready to think outside of the box. That is one of the big challenges because this is not like any education that they have been through right now. We don't sit and give a lecture or give, watch a movie or, you know, whatever, and then answer 10 questions and we're good. We want kids to be critical thinkers, um, analytical thinkers. So we are project-based. So you have, so finding people who are really well-versed in project-based education and what that means. Uh, Competency-based too. 
So what does that mean? What is competencies? What are the competencies in my content area that I know so well that I can manipulate the activity that the kids are going to do to fit what they want to learn more about, but still get to these competencies. Mm -hmm. So flexible thinking is probably the major issue that we have right now. I would say with Iowa Net High Academy, it's keeping my science and math teachers. I don't know what the deal is with them, but they tend to come and go real quick. So they do it for a while and then they're done. And then they do it for a while, you know. And so I'm constantly hiring science and math teachers, hmm. which is interesting. Yeah, that is really interesting. Yeah. I know there was a, I think I heard last year, there was a huge need for math teachers across schools was math. And I, I don't actually know why, did you know why that was? I don't know why people were struggling to find math teachers in general all last year. Is there a reason for that? Math teachers get paid better in the public, in the private sector than they do in public schools. And there's less hassle. I would say a major challenge in education right now is the control that our government wants to have on us. So the things that are coming, especially in Iowa, there's a lot of um, political things going on that are squelching the creativity, are squelching the, the motivation of our teachers to stay in the field. And that I see as our biggest, biggest worry for me. I think it's going to be easy for me to find people because I am that bring your creativity, bring your ideas, why you came into education to begin with, because these students need you, right? Mm. But there is a lot going on in education right now that is depressing a lot of our teachers and weighs heavy on them. And I think we need to pay attention to that. Yeah. And you made a really good point that we actually had one of our guests recently. I don't even think the podcast, as of us recording this, it's not even, it's not launched yet. It's launching soon. But he mentioned one of the things uh, that he said is like as a school leader, like the top school leader, they need to be caring about their their staff more than anything first and let the staff then care about the students, you know, not try and cut, you know, jump in between. And he said, what's happening is like these mass, talking about the mass exodus is these teachers go to school, they want to be a teacher, they want to just, they want to love on kids and all these things. And they get told, hey, you're going to be able to do this and you're going to make a difference and you're going to do this. And then they get in there and then the, the leader's like, Okay, so you can't teach on that. Here's the here's the list of criteria you have to stay with it. And they're like, oh, this is not what they told me it was going to be like at all. I'm out and type of thing. And I was like, dang. And I, I can see that. Do you have you kind of seen that maybe firsthand? Yes. Too? yes. And I would say that's why our democratic education. I belong to the alternative education resource organization, and there's a huge push, and it's surging for a democratic education where the kids get to decide where the kids come together and they say i'm going to work on this today and then the teachers are just the facilitators and the here's some support or here's some material or here you know here's a musician go play your horn all day you know those kinds of things and i think with the with the exodus of kids dropping out so right the 4500 they're telling us this system isn't working for me. And so we need to listen to, to that. They are telling us very clearly by not coming to school, that system is not working for me. And I've had superintendents tell me, you know, I boast a 94% graduation rate. I'm like, that's fabulous. But 15 students dropped out of your school. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you might think that's bad. Those are the words he said to me. You might think that's bad. And I just wanted to say, it's devastating to those 15. It is devastating when they don't get a high school diploma. You have just destined them to poverty. And, you're, and then he says, we're not looking for anything different. And that in education, that mindset needs to change too. We need to get back to loving each one of those kids that comes through our door and knowing each one of those kids that come through our door. And I know school districts are large and it students become lost in that. But at that local school level, we should have small enough or small enough classes or small enough caseloads for teachers that they know each one and they care for each one. Now, not all kids are lovable 
And I know that because I get a lot of those kids, right? They have pushed people's buttons. They have probably pushed and shoved some kids or teachers or whatever, but they're telling us they're not comfortable here. They're not welcomed here. They're not, I mean, how many times would you keep going back? And they're telling us I'm not going back. So as a society, we need to really think about each one of those students has a hope, has a dream. What is it and how can we best get them there? Man, and I love it, you, what you mentioned about the every kid matter, like the 15. You know, yes, it's a num I get it's a numbers thing, but when you go, oh, it's only 15, but in, I'm with you, I'm like, that's 15. Like, it, it, I don't even want it to be one. Like I want it to be uh, like all of them should. And it's like, and I think we've lo we lose that even as a country. I think we get away from that too, where it's like, oh, this many people passed away, or this many people are on this program, whatever. It's like, oh, like that's not good. Like it's yeah, the number. I get it. it. I get it. There's a business part of it, you know. But then you're like, those are still people we're talking about. You know, still lives that are messed up. So yes, I'm with you. Yeah. yeah, so we're you know we diving into these challenges and what you're you're up against. I know there's also wins. There's really cool things going on. So let's yes. uh, shift gears. Share share some big wins and brag about your school for a little bit. All right. So yes, and that's what keeps us going, right? Because we have these wonderful young human beings who, when they come to me, can't look me in the eye. They feel down. They feel stupid. They feel dumb. And then when the, we show them that they can do this, that this work is doable, that we can create learning environments and learning activities that they can succeed in, um, their whole demeanor changes. And when they graduate, they are proud they're ready to take on that next thing because that's the other thing that we do really well is we connect them to that next whatever part it is if they're going on to college we get them ready for that if they're going on to the trades we get them ready for that if they're going into a job we get them ready for that so that they have the skills they need to go do that and they're connected with that so those are really good wins i just got an email from one of our students in iowa net high academy who's now on the dean's list at isu all right. So, wow, you know, she was a girl that wasn't going to graduate. We got her to graduate. She went on to college. She's on the dean's list. I had a girl who was homeless. We gave her a computer and Wi-Fi. She would go to the local gas station to charge it up. I would go down to her camp uh, twice a week. And then she had another gal that would go and visit with her another two times a week. And now she is a mother and she lives on a farm. So no longer homeless, just, you know, we provide that hope. Another student who was living with a girlfriend, dad was in bad, bad shape. So not very supportive. He now works for Wells Fargo, the student graduated, works for Wells Fargo and bought his own home. So our kids are being successful. And that's another thing that I want to brag about is every single kid that graduates from our program, whether it's Iowa Net High, Jordal or I hope Choice Charter School yeah. now, <laughs> right, are either employed, gainfully employed, so that they can support themselves. They are going on to college, going on to apprenticeships or trades. I've had two stay-at-home moms who have stayed home and are wonderful moms to their kids and their spouses support them. So it's just success stories. When we provide them the education that they need that helps them move to the next and dream of a better future. They then have a better future. Yeah. Mm, That's so good. All right. So we got wins. We got stuff going on. Yes, this, is, yes. this is exciting. We're going to have some super cool wins next year when we talk about choice and all these kids that are getting a new start. Because you, with choice, you're going to have possibly these 20 year olds. You said you're going to have like yep. a okay, yep. 20. Okay. Yep. How does that how does that work? Are they technically seniors or no grade technically? How does that work when you do have a 19, 20, 21 year old? So usually they go by how many credits they have. Dropouts usually have a year, typically a year and a half to two years to finish. They usually drop out sophomore, you know, sophomore, junior year. That's typical. Atypical is, and I've had a few of these, they've got two classes to finish and they just never finished them and they never went back. So those kids, that's an easy win. Come in, we'll get you your two classes. Within a month, you're done. 
And so onward you go. The students that need a little bit more, you know, are going to go into those career clusters and get get some job skills, get some information on what the careers, what are the possibilities within that cluster? Because a lot of them don't even know that. What is out there? What's possible for me? And what is what is there currently if they're wanting to do that and choice doesn't happen? Like what happens? Where are these? How do these kids get the stuff they need to get a degree? Or their diploma. Oh, Iowa, they can go to a junior college and get that. We call it the high set here in Iowa. So they would need to go to a junior college. They would need to pay for it. They sit for a test. If they cannot pass the test, then they sit in a class of like maybe a math class. They sit in a math class until they tell the instructor thinks that they can pass the math test. Then they take the math test and then they go through the reading and they sit in the reading class until they get. And what I've found with the students that come back to me from those kinds of programs is they've said to me, I've been in math for three months and I still can't pass the test. Grief. And I thought if you'd only taken those three months and come to my program, we'd probably be halfway done with what you need to get done. So yeah, it's a hard test. It is passable. So people pass it because they have it, but it's probably an easier route to sit with our school and get the credits you need and move on man sure and man and i got two questions for you before for wrapping it up my, my first one you mentioned doing some fundraising earlier in our conversation i've brought this up a couple of times for different guests is there some fundraisers that you really really love that work really really good for you guys that maybe other school leaders go "Ooh, i never thought about doing that that fundraiser before any that are stand out to you that you'd like to share i do not because i haven't spent a lot of time doing that because i'm spending too much time helping kids i've tried like community foundations and that kind of thing we have prairie meadows in iowa which is a gambling casino and some funds you can get some funds from there and just finding grants is the other big thing. Sure. Okay. Just curious. I know this is the right hook I gave you right there. I was like, oh, let me yeah, ask you about that's all right. <laughs> yeah. I don't do a lot of it. I ask anybody that will let, talk to me. So we need some funds. Can you give some funds? <laughs> that works too. That's yeah. why I know you're active on LinkedIn and I know there's different places yep. that put content out there so people know what you're up to and what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, and both cool. schools are 501. So both of my schools are 5013s. So okay. they're both nonprofits. Okay. Perfect. So tax write off. See? Yes. There you go. Well, as we wrap it up, I always like to end with the same final question for the guests is just giving you a chance to share any piece of wisdom or, or advice for any of the other school leaders that are listening in. The big advice I have is to listen to your children, listen to your young people and talk to them about why is it that what you have in place right now isn't working and then work towards that and work outside the box. We have to just start thinking more outside of eight to four or even eight to six, you know, sometimes they extend their school day, but it's might not be enough for some kids. Yeah. They might need to go to school at 11 o'clock at night. So we just need to listen and we need to care about every single one. Because each one has a story. Yes. Each and one has a story. Yes, yeah. they do. So yeah. good. Well, thank you so much for taking time. And again, you're out camping and you're hopping on this podcast. So thank you for taking time and for your heart, honestly, Cynthia, I know I can see it. You love students. You have a heart for them to excel and get to that next level. I see it and I hear it. So I'm just want to give you kudos and encourage you to continue to do what you're doing. I know you're launching this new school. So I'm wishing you guys nothing but the best as that launches here in the fall and uh, yeah, keep doing what you're doing because you're awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, another huge shout out and a thank you to Cynthia for taking time and being on the podcast today. She is amazing and doing some awesome things in the state of Iowa. And I absolutely love her vision and her love for students in that next generation. So I'm wishing her nothing but the best as she continues to push forward there in the state of Iowa. 
And as always, guys, I'm hoping maybe from today you were able to take at least one thing from today's episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. That's my vision. That's my goal for you guys. And maybe you're in a weird spot right now with your school and you feel stuck and you're trying to grow enrollment or find different ways to connect with your families, whatever those may be. I'd love to personally hear from you. So you can obviously do that. Reach out to me on LinkedIn or on social media. My handle is at Mitchell R. Slater. That's at Mitchell R. Slater. Connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, wherever. Or I can find you on the private Facebook community where I'm personally involved in that we have just for school leaders called School Success Makers. I'd love to see you in there. School Success Makers on Facebook. It's just a private community I made for school leaders. And I'm personally in there as well as a lot of the guests that have been on the podcast. So I'd love to see you in there. And again, you can check us out online too, schoolsuccessmakers.com and get involved with how we can help schools grow enrollment and take some of those things off of your plate so you don't have to worry about them anymore. So you can do what you do best, which is love and educate the next generation. We help you get those students through your doors so that you can do just that. We will be here next week with another amazing guest as usual on the School Success Podcast. We'll see you then.